Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing the ROI of adding intelligence to data, sponsored this month by Simarchy and Monte Carlo. Excuse me. The, Yes, and so just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. To open the Q&A panel or the chat panel, you will find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And just to know the chat default sends to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me turn it over to Stephen from Simarchy for a brief word from our first sponsor. Stephen, hello and welcome. Hey, Shannon. Thanks Thanks for uh, introducing us. Um, can you hear Can you hear me all right? Hi, you, you sound good and I see your slides just great. Perfect. Hi, everyone. My name is Stephen Lin. I'm the product marketing manager here at Simarchy. Um, today, I'm going to share with you very briefly on how our unified data platform can help you master your data and accelerate uh, the ROI on your data quality. So a little bit of a background on who we are. So we're a master data management leader, um, recognized by most analysts in the industry and probably many of your peers. We've done this rodeo a couple of times. We have about 300 clients across the world uh, with very different industries, different use cases, um, and our main claim to fame is really about 80% of our clients typically can deliver a tailored MDM solution in about 12 weeks, so a little uh, under three months. And then once they sort of get that up and running, improve the quality and see the benefits, they usually leverage us for more than one use case or another domain that they add on. Oops. So why is the quality challenging and how does MDM fit into this, right? The biggest thing that we see from our clients is that one, their data ecosystem is growing extremely fast and so are their business needs, right? And oftentimes, maybe not always in the same direction. So it brings a lot of frustrations. And as you might probably be aware from your own experiences, the data needs are less simplistic now. There's not just a single uh, use case or a single team managing um, and stewarding all this data to create the high quality data that you would need for analytics or other business use cases. Um, it's a little bit more convoluted and complex um, like this, right? So just because you have a customer 360, um, that's not the end of it. That's not the only data that you need to manage and ensure that there's high quality because customers buy products and different partners uh, will share data uh, with you to you know, create these products. Customers also you know, give you money. So finance needs to be involved to uh, make sure that these invoices are collected, they're reconciled um, and so on and so forth. So there needs to be something sort of foundational um, to sort of tie all this together and organize it in a way that's actually meaningful. Um, but we still recognize this, there's still a lot of headaches, right? Because without something to um, organize the complexity, uh, make it more manageable, you do run into these situations where you're asking these very vague and large important questions such as what is the value of doing something like this? Why start now? Where do we start? How do we deliver and who can we trust, right? Uh, because so far, uh, maybe like Excel spreadsheet has worked, uh, but will it work, continue working forever? So those are some of the things that we run into quite frequently. So the main point of MDM is it really helps accelerate this alignment between what your business need and your data teams need and it creates a collaborative foundation so you can actually ensure that you can measure and deliver ROI on your data quality initiatives. Okay, so a lot of talk. How do I actually get started today? Uh, what are some lessons learned that we can share from our uh, decade-long experience um, to you guys? So the biggest thing that we see um, in our client success is starting small. So really prioritizing a single use case or domain. Most of the times that uh, customer 360 um, just because customers are typically the largest sort of data domain uh, for our customers, but there's very different ways you can start depending on what is the most important and most critical uh, domain for you. And actually aligning it to see results, right? Aligning it to actual business KPI. Oftentimes we see our um, clients get bogged down into the sort of baseline metrics of, okay, we increased our data accuracy or um, duplicate data, 
but aren't really sure how to align it to the business of what actually quote unquote matters to them is increasing, let's say month to month revenue growth, right? So an actual business KPI that matters to them. And then as we sort of look into more solutioning um, and design uh, and wanting to scale um, because the future is always gonna be changing, Something that is future ready uh, is something that's important that we preach to our clients and how we design our solution, something that's easily configurable, um, no code, not complex, that business users can understand, something that's flexible and open architecture. So as new data sources come in, technologies change, it can rapidly adapt without you having to migrate to another solution. And then something that's like a unified data platform like ours, right? So something that has more than one capability that can help you solve the different angles and areas of challenges that data quality um, can creep in. So what do we actually sell, right? So we have these two incredible modules uh, in a single unified data platform. We have XDI, which helps orchestrate uh, data from your source systems to your target systems. And then XDM is sort of this mastering engine uh, that you configure um, your business rules and requirements without any code. And then it generates custom applications for your business teams or your data teams to uh, manage the data, improve the data quality collaboratively, then finally um, ensure that it pushes the trusted golden records with high quality data to your analytics or um, operational lead needs into sort of um, updating your systems and applications. So that's in a nutshell what we can do. And you can deploy this anywhere, whether it's on-prem, cloud, or hybrid. So um, if you want to um, ensure that your business teams and data teams are working together to help um, improve the uh, ROI of data quality, Samarki is definitely here to help. Thanks, Shannon. Back to you. Even thank you so much for kicking us off. And thanks to Simarki for sponsoring and helping to make these webinars happen. If you have any questions for Stephen, feel free to submit the questions in the Q&A section of your screen as he'll be joining us at the Q&A at the end of the webinar. And now let me turn it over to Jesse from Monte Carlo for a brief word from our second sponsor. Jesse, hello and welcome. Hello, and thanks for having me. All right, I'm gonna do a quick overview of Monte Carlo um, and just kind of, we're excited to be part of this conversation today because uh, the ROI of data quality really does tie in closely to, at Monte Carlo, what we see a lot of. So by quick introduction, I'm Jesse Miller. I'm on the product team at Monte Carlo. And um, we're going to talk about something called, real quick, called data downtime. It's kind of a term we use at Monte Carlo. And it really could be best described uh, with a meme. Um, data downtime it kind of encapsulate is very much encapsulated by this meme. It's a it's a period of time when your data is down, unavailable. Um, it's got errors in it, or otherwise just you know not accessible to your team. And it really, you know, this has become something that a lot of data teams have just become okay with. It's something we just kind of uh, you know we know it's going to happen, so we just like sit in the burning room and we just tell ourselves that it's fine. Um, and it's it's something that's quite common with a lot of the customers that we talk to or, you know, people that are asking about data quality. Um, but we know that data downtime or data quality issues have a huge impact on your business. Um, you know, we know from talking with our customers that, you know, around seven, 70 high severity incidents occur every single year per 1,000 tables. Um, this is something that we've kind of learned from talking with our customers. And uh, we also know that when those incidents occur, that around 30 to 50% of a data engineering's time is spent on drills, these fire drills to actually correct these issues and correct these data quality issues. And furthermore, we know that really 80% of data science analytics teams spend their time trying to fix, clean, and preparing this data. And there's a lot really going into this. And so you see there's a lot of time sink going into just working with data and bad data even. And all this ends up with kind of kind of a point to bring it home. We know um, from research that around 12 to 27% of annual revenue lost uh, is can be due and attributed to poor data quality. And so that's a big impact for having data downtime and poor data quality on your data. Now, what we also know is that data downtime incidents, a lot of those occur, 90% of those occur with downstream consumer detection. 
and only 10% of those that really happen today um, uh, upstream and are detected at the time of code or through some automated test. And ultimately, this 90% of faults or you know delayed detection of these data quality incidents lead to weeks or you know days, weeks, months passing before these issues are discovered, detected, and ultimately resolved. Now, in all of this negativity, um, there is some good parts of this. And there's some the good part is that data downtime or data quality incidents largely look similar across companies. Um, this is kind of, you know, can be demonstrated by asking them some similar questions. You know, is my data up to date? Does the size of the data look off? Uh, you know, why is this value suddenly higher than what the normal rolling average is? These are many questions that we can ask. And this kind of makes us, you know, have this, this template of what data downtime or data quality incidents look like. And so at Monte Carlo, this is really what we what we do. Um, we form these five pillars around data observability uh, to address data quality incidents and data downtime. These are the five pillars that really form the foundations of the Monte Carlo platform, freshness, volume, distribution, schema, and lineage. And all these pillars together go, go together to help you and help our customers solve, detect, solve, and ultimately try to prevent data quality incidents in their data pipelines. Um, so that's what we do at Monte Carlo. Um, there's some great resources that we have out there kind of about um, data quality incidents. And if you'd like to learn more, um, definitely look us up afterwards. But I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Back to you. See, thank you so much. And thanks to Monte Carlo for also sponsoring and to make these webinars happen. And likewise, if you have any questions for Jesse, feel free to submit them in the Q&A section of your screen as he'll be joining us in the Q&A at, at the end of the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best known organizations, his strategies in for, uh, from the form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lakes, streaming, and data integration products. With that, I'll give the floor to William to get his presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello and thank you, Shannon. Thank you also, Stephen and Jesse, for those great uh, presentations up front. Hello from rainy Texas today. Much needed. Here. Okay, so I'm talking about a topic that has been around, oh, since probably about the dawn of man or the dawn of language. I can certainly imagine that there were cavemen back in the day uh, in their grunting uh, ways uh, saying to each other, well, I made a mark on this stone for every spear that we have. And I thought there were 100 and there's only 99. Where's the missing spear? And that's just carried forward into the explosion of data quality issues that we have today. So to be sure, it's still an issue. And so what I wanna do is clear up some of the cobwebs around data quality and get you all on a great path to improving something that Jesse just showed us how important it is to the bottom line of our business. So I'm going to talk about what is data quality? How do you know when you have enough of it? What does a violation look like? What can we do about it? And how do we ultimately determine the ROI of data quality efforts, which I think is a good way to help you uh, justify the addition of data quality to whatever it is that you're doing. You'll certainly hear a lot of my philosophies uh, on this uh, sort of thing coming through and where I find uh, data quality should be placed in the organization and so on. So let's dive in. Like Jesse just said, enterprise data is still a mess. The proliferation of data sources, these are what I attribute uh, the problem to. The complexity of data formats. Now we have so many more formats and so many uh, different data styles or different, different types of, of data stores. So we've got, of course, relational databases, cloud storage, NoSQL databases, uh, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. So many different data types. New ones seem to come up that are very important every three to four months. And so uh, the uh, vendors are, are, I mean, they have dedicated teams that are just keeping their, their, their software up to date with these formats. And of course, that's generating different kinds of data. 
the lack of data governance. I still have to say the lack of data governance. Now, I do believe that as time has gone on here, a lot more of you, a lot more enterprises out there are acknowledging the need for what they're calling data governance. And but I and we're still in the early days, though, of really making it super effective in a lot of organizations. So I'm going to address that because that's where the data quality rules come from. So that's where we start to learn where we have violations and what we can do about it. This is not a technical issue, this issue of data quality. You're going to have to have business uh, interests heavily involved in this process. And that can become the bottleneck. So we'll talk about that as we go on. And then there's this big push into AI, which is really a new form of data utilization, like we need an, another one. Well, apparently we do. And so we are marching headlong into using data for these really complex and important purposes and using every last square inch of data that we can get our hands on. And so it is all the more important that that data have great data quality. You see what gets the budget in organizations. A lot of times it's the uses of the data. It's what, it's what the executives see. I want this dashboard. I want this utilization of data, this application and so on. But what about the data that it uses? That is where the majority of the budget should be. The data should be screaming out, hey, here's what you get to do with me. And also maybe doing some of it on its own, but it can't do that. If it, if it is a poor quality. So if you keep putting Band-Aids on a gushing wound by just continuing to work on those dashboards and those things that are above the, the waterline that everybody gets to see, but not the 90% of the effort which is behind the scenes, then you're really not getting too far. So I must say, we got to focus on data if we're going to fix data quality issues. We can't just keep changing data in the dashboard, changing data for this report, changing data for this KPI, because it's it's coming off the database wrong, but we're just gonna fix it right here. Let's fix it. Let's fix it back at the closer to the source. So, but William, we have this CDO function in our organization. Now, I've been consulting to CDOs. I have a, a CDO advisory service. I've been doing this for about five years. And I can tell you that it, it tends to become a political position like a lot of other things, right? So um, I try to keep the CDO focused on hyper-shared artifacts like the data warehouse, the data lake, and master data manager. And by the way, hyper-shared, that's my term. You know what I mean? It's These have a lot of leverage. They're used once, they're used twice, they're used many, many times for many, many things. And so the leverage is, is higher in these types of artifacts. Now, that being said, I do acknowledge that at any point in time in an enterprise, there is one application that is kind of the feature application for these hyper-shared artifacts, and we do focus on that. But over time, if done right, these artifacts support many, many applications. So let's focus there. Data architecture, yeah, that should be the CDO's focus. I'm just rounding it out here. Data innovation, new ways to use the data. The CDO is responsible for driving innovation in the organization's use of data. This includes exploring new data technologies and applications and developing new ways to use data to improve the organization's business performance. And finally, I see the data governance function and the data quality function as a result of that coming under the CDO's focus very intently. So when it comes to who, what executive level is going to be responsible for this issue we're talking about today, I'm saying the CDO, if you got one. And studies show that a lot of you do. Data quality is essential to business success. Correct data is a widespread need, yet data quality lacks consistent definition. So we got to put some definition around it, or we're just not going to get anywhere. So many organizations, people walk around saying the data lacks quality and nobody drills in on, well, what are you talking about? Is it missing? Is it wrong? Uh, is it not fit for purpose? Are there gaps? Uh, I'll get into all the, all the various data quality defects as we go along here, but it's important to drill in when people are talking about data quality. Half the time, 
they're not what I would call data quality issues. They're more about, well, the dashboard looks wrong or um, we're loading the wrong sets of data. These aren't necessarily data quality issues, but uh, allow for a lot of freedom um, by your stakeholders to, to, to say things and go with the flow of what they're saying and figure it out. But if you need a definition for data quality, and I'm not trying to be profound here, <laughs> A lack of intolerable defects in the data. That's about the most unprofound statement I could probably make about it. But yet it does carry the connotation of what I want you to, how I want you to think about data quality, a lack of intolerable defects. So you see, we are dealing with a discipline, data quality, that most people don't care about it until they do, until it bites them. Usually it's not considered critical path. What is critical path? Well, it's building the application, it's building the database it's that you know the, that will support the application and uh, building the the dashboard or the AI or however you're going to use the data. Those are considered critical path. But I don't think data quality is quite yet in many organizations anyway. Kind of cross that chasm into okay, it's it's in line with those things. It must be considered up front early and often. But you now that you know at least after this webinar you'll know. You probably already know that data quality is really important and you must be an advocate now for it. And you must cite the downside risk, the risk of doing this application, doing this AI, for example. Um, I forget who it was at uh, the uh, Teradata show last uh, last week, cited from the, from the speaker platform that you cannot, if you cannot trust your data, you cannot trust your AI. And I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. So... Consider these business imperatives, and this is going to lead into some architecture. Information-based in-store and contact center cross and upselling. What do you need there in order to do that well, do that function well? You need clean customer and product data. You see, you can cross-reference your business imperative to your business subject areas, and those subject areas are mastered somewhere within the organization or maybe they're not, they're all over the place and they should be mastered. So we're talking here about customer. I think Jesse alluded to customer being very important. Yes, credit card fraud detection, that needs clean customer. Almost everything needs customer uh, and transaction data. Supply chain efficiencies, I'm gonna say that needs clean product and location data. Of course, I'm just skimming the surface here to really do a great job at any of your business imper imperatives there's a whole lot of uh, data subject areas that need to be clean, but let's start with the biggest bang for the buck. It's often customer and product. Now, I've just mentioned that I want these, or I suggest these be put in leverageable uh, artifacts like master data management for things like what we're talking about here today. All of these business imperatives have failed or underperformed because of incomplete, incorrect, inconsistent data or let's say data quality issues. So I think it's important for you to go now and cross-reference all your business imperatives with subject areas. And, and that will help you to see how important some of these subject areas are, how important it might be to build them once in MDM, I suggest, and use it many times for all of these applications, not have everyone roll on their own out there. Okay. So we're gonna make some investments in data quality. I'm gonna show you a little bit later where those investments can go, but what are these investments going to do? They're going to give you cleaner data and somebody somewhere is saying, so what to that, by the way. Business objectives cannot be met without quality data and support. Yeah, we know this. Data quality returns are in the improved efficacy of projects targeting business objectives. There's no, you came for data quality ROI, but I kind of fooled you. There is no data quality ROI. The ROI is in the applications that use the data that hopefully are going to uh, provide enough data quality to retain those R, that, that ROI, all right? And it should be an integral part of most projects. Hopefully you'll agree with me by the end of this. So it's important to know about data quality. It's important to act on data quality issues. I think a lot of us know but we're not all acting. Maybe we don't know what to do. Um, it's it's not it's not a proper strategy to to just do just beat the data into submission to us and and not do things systemically. 
and not do it without business input and governance. So you don't necessarily need a tool. We'll get to that. Tools can be distracting, but oftentimes uh, depends on the data, the level of the data quality issues in an organization as to whether I would recommend a tool or not. The benefit of clean data though, remember I said somebody somewhere is saying, so what? It's not enough. Not enough to go to your organization and say, we're going to clean the data for you. Now, in some data-driven organizations, okay, I'd say those organizations that have kind of crossed that chasm and, and they recognize the value of data from top to bottom. Uh, there's not too many of them. But in those organizations, you can get away with stuff like this more. But even in those organizations, I would say, let's draw it back to ROI. Let's talk about the strategic benefit of it how it's going to lower TCO, which is a form of ROI. That just means you're lowering expenses. Now, data quality should have a value proposition to a, to a project or projects. And let's, 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 go in a, let's go in a stepwise manner here. These are not ROIs, but they lead to ROI. And you gotta go here and understand what category of, of, of thing that you are improving by improving data quality. Are you improving decision-making? Are you increasing efficiency? Are you reducing risk, et cetera, what you see there? All of these things can be taken further into ROI. You, you gotta start here, and but you cannot stop here. And that's kind of the point. So let's get to data governance. Uh, some of us are, are calling this data, part of data DevOps now, or de just straight up DevOps, um, however you say it. People experience a range of emotions in the process of transformation. Data governance is about transformation of the organization. And we want people to be involved and uh, use our data governance program to keep business interest in data quality, keep the idea of data quality being important, keep that alive in the organization. You can find probably most of you can find five ways in the next month to inject this idea into your business. Maybe it's through a presentation you're giving. Maybe it's going to be a side comment to an executive at the right point in time. I don't know. There's a few different ways that you can keep that alive. But I can tell you that if you have this going in your organization, good data governance, marching towards being data driven and that sort of thing, if you have that, it will grease the kids for your data quality program. You won't have to fight so hard to get funds for data quality. You won't have to fight so hard to prove that it's important, et cetera, et cetera. However, most of you probably are still going to have to fight the good fight here. Okay. Now, when it comes to data governance, there's a wide mix of uh, effective implementations of data governance. I'm afraid that many enterprises have have made it more of a academic exercise. And this very malleable term of data governance cannot be a technical exercise for long. I've seen them. We all have, I still say a good 50% of the so-called data governance programs out there are not helping the applications. And that's what I want these to do, help applications without also establishing accountability and tangible delivery. Establishing data governance is not helpful. Deliver to the organization, both in support of projects or applications and as a horizontal organizational function. But mostly, I mean, if you're not in support of applications, then uh, the data governance is not accountable. It's not, it's not going to uh, last for very long in an organization. The governance needs to strongly align itself with those data stores that have high leverage in the organization. So I've mentioned this probably three times now. Okay. okay, so we keep coming back to leverageable data stores, MDM, data warehouse, data lake, those sorts of things. I'm gonna pick up a little bit here. Without a basis in data, a lot of, a lot of data quality, I said already it's, it's about the business, right? Okay, it, it's about communication. Without a basis in data quality, the counterparty has no idea what you're talking about. And I, I said this before, you know, people, it's, it's like people on, on Twitter walking around just kind of talking into the air, right? And this is what it feels like when an organization is having its data quality 
uh, uh, discussions. Oftentimes, it's it's people talking over each other, people talking past each other, not understanding. So, bring this, uh, bring some ideas from your experiences, and try to lay down that culture. Listen actively and attentively. Be open and honest. Be patient and understanding. Be flexible. Compromise where where possible, and so on. The, don't make this a rigid. You must do this, or the company is going to fall over tomorrow that you know change this one field right so um you know speak appropriately in your communications about data quality and it's real work by the way it's not an afterthought it's something you got to think about you've got to think about those messages and being effective with your message especially today when we all seem to be working remotely we don't really have a lot of face time and uh we have to make the most of our limited interactions anymore. So I do recommend for data governance, and this is not the data governance presentation, but it helps data quality, have those meetings, have it on a regular basis, make decisions, actions, have great timing, and understand that the focus of governance will change over time as the applications change over time. But change part of data quality is changing processes and changing data, changing those things anywhere requires extreme buy-in and edu education about the change. So if we wanna make changes, we need some support. Data governance can be that support for us. Now let's measure some data quality. This, was, this is fine. Only a methodological approach will work. It must be a repeatable process, must be progressive improvement. You're not gonna go from zero to 100 overnight you are going to have to make little changes it's kind of like you're going to the gym and you're trying to improve your bench press it's not going to go from 135 to 225 uh in in one session it might inch its way up to 140 next week etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh that kind of progressive improvement is what we need out of our data quality so i'm going to show you how to measure it here in a bit um, this methodological approach must encompass new data because we're always getting new data and we're always getting changing requirements. So it has to be that kind of program. It can't be locked down to today, to the way things are today. You see, the causes of poor data quality keep coming in the front door. So we're, 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 we're behind the door and we're trying to uh, clean up what's in our house, but we keep opening the door and in comes new trash. I don't know if that was a great analogy or not, but you know what I mean? The causes of poor data quality keep coming in. So we got to get on top of it. So let's have a data quality improvement program. Define those quality expectations, profile the data, measure the data quality options, select the best one, and then go about improving the data. Now I have whole presentations on just this slide, just that process. Um, but this is the process. And this is this is a mouthful here. Uh, I just said, define the quality expectations as if we all know what that is. Well, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. I'm just setting the stage here a little bit before we dive into the pieces. Again, though, it's important. Define the expectations. It's not going to be 100%. Define where it needs to be. And I, and I highly recommend grading the data quality in every one of these databases, these leverageable artifacts, and others. Profiling the, the data so you know what your grade is now. Measuring some data quality improvement options, because there's always options as to what you can do about data quality. A lot of times the options fall into, and I'll get into it, but I'll just kind of lead with this now. You're, you're going to change data entry. You're going to cross-check data to see if it's correct, or you're going to change data. Those are some of the things that we can do about it. Now, what do we want to do something about? Well, these are the data quality rule categories. And if these are violated, you have a data quality violation. Congratulations. We probably all have a bunch of them. Align business processes with data-driven insights. If they are not aligned, if, uh, if, if business is conducting business as usual, without bringing enough data to bear on it. Now you might say, William, that sounds like an application. You're, you're getting into applications. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this under data quality though, because we're not, you're not using the data properly when you're 
your business processes are not aligned with data. And it's often because of communication. Data-driven decision-making are decisions being made based on data that you have, that you have readily available or not. Does the data conform to referential integrity? The uniqueness you would you would expect in, in a field like a uh, customer number, that should be unique. What if it isn't? That's a quality violation. Cardinality, is that correct? Does a person have, if you're B2C and you're keeping track of people's, I don't know, cars, is it reasonable that one person could have one car, of course, one to two? Yes, of course. And one to, I don't know what the, the magic number is, 10. Uh, beyond that, it may look kind of fishy. And maybe there was a fat finger there, or maybe somebody was using that field for something else, on and on. All these things happen inside of organizations. I'll give you some examples. But the point we're getting at is, when are you doing enough? When are you doing enough uh, to, to meet the quality standard that is required? Now, I would also add here that the quality standard for a data warehouse or one of these leverageable uh, platforms is higher. So these are your four actions that you can perform. Actually, I've got five. <laughs> five actions to perform for data quality. I mentioned them before. Screen data entry, add cross-checking, quarantine data, which is just a transfer of data quality violation to somewhere else. It's, it's a bit like kicking the, the can down the road, but still you can do that and prevent the quality violation from going forward into your architecture. You can report on quality violations, let it flow, but report on it, let somebody know that should care about this so that they can fix the future so that it doesn't keep coming in that front door, maybe. Maybe that's what you do. Or you change or repair and correct data to conform to data quality. And all this is about preventing improper use of data and raising the awareness of data quality. Yes, data quality can be automated. And as much as you can automate, go for it. Data profiling can be used to automate data quality checks, data cleansing, validation, everything you see there. Now, uh, I wouldn't go out implementing, uh, mo most of us are in a position of data architecture. Um, I wouldn't go out and start implementing data quality automatically without getting it clear through data governance that this is what is happening. And data governance should, of course, have subject matter experts on the uh, different domains, and they should be empowered to speak on behalf of the organization for those domains. So you got if you got that set up, then you're then you're running uh, data governance efficiently, and you can do things like this. Put your data quality and leverageable platform. I think I've already beat this with a hammer. Uh, I've, I've added data hub here because some things are not called these other things, but uh, yet they are a they are a leverageable platform for multiple applications, which I think is great, and I, I like to focus on those things. Every project needs to focus on data quality, clean data is the key to unlocking the power of many processes, including some of the ones that I mentioned before. Now, having clean customer product transaction location data is essential for these projects to be successful. So wherever you you're, you're have your clean data, maybe it's a hub, hopefully it's more MBM based, uh, maybe it's in the data warehouse if it's more transaction based, but there should be a go-to place. And it shouldn't be that every application needs to create their own copy of that data warehouse because they don't like the the uh, the transformations that somebody somewhere did for these, or maybe just that group's hard to work with, or IT is hard to work with, or I'm just shooting in the dark here and I just like control. So if that's the case, then you need to become a more effective IT or let's say a, a, let's say a shadow IT organization so that you are providing leverageable data to the uh, enterprise. Now, how much, uh, here's the big question, uh, how much money should be spent on data quality? Well, uh, sometimes I'm given zero, and I know you're given zero, but we do it anyway. We find other categories of effort within the project to do data quality in. That's not great. I mean, that's, um, that is less effective, but it's all about how how we want to phrase things. S to some people, it's perfectly fine to do data quality. What we're talking about is data quality as part of data integration. 
uh, as part of data architecture. Okay, that's fine. That's great. But if it's not, and somebody is saying that don't, you know, don't waste your time on data quality. Well, that's another matter. But 10% of the budgets somewhere, some way, somehow should be spent on data quality right now for most data quality of, of most projects, excuse me, because most projects use data. And this is a kind of where things are. That's kind of my starting point. And I can definitely be swayed to more or less based upon the level of data and how much data is being used and so on and so forth. But as a rule of thumb, 10% of the budget on this stuff. No, note that data quality will never be perfect. Hopefully it becomes all of these things though. This is your goal. Make it one through 10 and then you've got 11 there fit for purpose. So how do you know? Well, this is not easy, but I do advise that you score your data quality, adherence over the possibilities. So understanding what you're expecting out of the data for it to be hugely successful, and then going and profiling to measure where you are with that. Okay. And, um, the tricky part here is the bottom uh, sentence. Multiple prorated rules are used to determine the overall system score. And where many organizations fail is they, 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 they hear this, uh, they get this, they wanna do it, but how do, you, how do you come up with, let's say 10 data quality rules that are going to define the data quality for this data warehouse, for example? How are you going to do that? Well, with the help of governance, hopefully, but it can be done. And I'm one that's, I'm going to trial balloon things. And uh, uh, I'll apologize later if I got it wrong, but I'm, I'm going to start putting scores out and people are going to start asking, where'd you get that score? And maybe that will generate the conversation necessary to get that uh, scoring down a little bit tighter. But I really like it when the, the culture understands that we are scoring data quality. And that is a motivator right there to get the data quality score up. And you can do celebrations around that and so on and so forth. It's fun. Data quality is fun. Cost to the enterprise of poor data quality. Yeah, there are so many. Um, I, and Jesse mentioned some of them uh, in his presentation before, but one off data quality, repeated remediations. So I fixed data quality, but I didn't make it systemic. I put a Band-Aid on my problem, but the rest of the organization still got a big data quality problem. So we're going to repeat data quality efforts. Poor, failed enterprise initiatives. And that's that's huge. That's huge right there. And sometimes you don't know until down the road that you've been doing, let's say, predictive maintenance with bad data. You've been doing targeted marketing with bad data. You've been doing fraud detection with bad data. And so you haven't been doing a great job at it. I mean, not as great as it could be, right? And so whatever the ROI is on those projects could be improved if you had better data quality. How much How much ROI? How much data quality improvement? Well, did I say that this was all science and not some art? Uh, I don't think I did because it is a lot of art. It is a lot of just abstract thinking. And that's one thing I like about it is uh, we're, not, we're not doing it uh, by the numbers here. Data quality, it's, it's, it's so multifaceted. It requires you to think uh, in the abstract quite a bit in order to get this right. So for example, which rules are you going to go after? Which applications are you going to suggest are getting improved by you doing this? And by the way, what thing are you doing? Because there's a few things you can do. So you, could, you also have, just to round it out here, poor data quality, misguided roadmaps. You decided to do a, a, a roadmap based upon data quality issues, and it comes back to buy you. Compliance cost. That's a driver for a lot of data quality efforts out there today. You might end up in a situation where compliance, not only adhering to it, but maybe in a fine situation is costing you. And then you can, you can have various dollar per data record attributed to however many dollars that makes sense failed outreach you're losing customers that therefore you lose their customer lifetime value to the business storage space for keeping uh poor data with a bunch of duplicate records incorrect marketing segmentation personalization these things really add up and the cost expands 
because on average, corporate data is growing at 40% per year. So uh, <clears throat> until you get a handle on your data quality issues, it just keeps expanding. That front door keeps opening. So for example, let me give you a ROI example here. I'm going to use a simple one that I hope we can all relate to, just targeted marketing. And we're sending out mass emails or something uh, with our promotion on it. Okay, so we got a bunch of data, a bunch of customer data. Uh, some of it's bad. Some of it's always bad, but we want fewer bad contact data. We want more good, I guess I could have said. We want to improve our customer segmentation. Bad data, bad segmentation, meaning bad marketing. Higher marketing initiative ROI, that's the bottom line. So we have these potential hypothetical data quality scores, 85, 90, and 95. Well, William, where'd the score come from? Well, I, I just went over that. It's adherence over the possibilities. And you're prorating a bunch of different scores to come up with an overall number. I like it for the scoring to kind of land where our scoring used to land in grade school, right? 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, et cetera, et cetera. But to each his own as far as that goes. So you can reach a certain number of prospects based upon a higher data quality score. You will get higher return on marketing with better customer profiles because the targeting is better. And then there's, but the average profit of a <clears throat> conversion doesn't change. So you do the math. Then you uh, understand what is the investment. I'm on the second to last column there. What is the investment to get to 95, to 90, to 85? Well, what if I do nothing? Oh, okay, well, then it's 60. You got zero for investment there. You don't have to do anything extra to get your whatever, 60. Uh, and then you can measure the ROI. And as you can see in this example, it looks like the higher the data quality score, the higher the ROI. Oh, but look, you had to spend, what is it? Uh, 100,000 more, uh, is that right? 10,000 more, excuse me, to get to the 95 data quality score. That's okay. It pays for itself. And I'm, I'll have a big statement for you in regards to that as we're going up. So how do you, how do you know this stuff? Well, fortunately, I've never really had to know this. Uh, but I do know how to set that table for the business interests, uh, in this case in marketing, that should know this. And if they don't, there are things we can do. We can do some A-B testing in a limited market to see how we do with different levels of data quality. Uh, but we can sit here and guess. And a lot of times the, the guess, and I, I don't mean just a stick your finger in the air kind of guess, but a good educated guess goes a long way. I just wanted to give you a quick time check. We're about 12 minutes away. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So much to say. Okay. Let me uh, finish up here. So this is a different example, different data quality scores, same kind of deal though. But here we see that raising the data quality score all the way up to a 99 is not going to give you the best ROI. We find the best value proposition here is spend the 200,000, get it to 98, call it a day, keep it there, and move on. Here's some other examples. So, oh no, this is a little bit more of the example that we just showed you. Reverse, the, what, what can we do? Well, how did we get the data quality score up? Remember, I said there's a few ways. Screen the entry. Uh, we can cross-check the data, which is what we're going to do here. But we can change the data based upon what we know. So cross-checking the data here means that we're going to use a third-party service and cross-check our customer addresses, cross-check our customer demographics. We're gonna purchase additional prospects that look like our good prospects and so on. We're gonna use multiple and different third-party providers and corresponding deduplication results. So not just one, but two. So a combination of these things is gonna drive our data quality score up, which in a limited way will drive up the overall uh, ROI of the application. Here's some other examples. I'll just mention the AI exam applications, okay? Many of us are doing AI applications in all our verticals. Inaccurate or non-representative data leads to biased and inaccurate results, which lead to subpar application ROI and potential compliance costs. Increased computation leads to increased expenses of all that inaccurate data. 
And that's a factor when it comes to AI applications. So here's my big bottom line for you. If you can materially, i.e. by 1%, improve any of these or any of these types of items or literally a hundred other things that you can think of for your business, and you do a reasonable job with data quality, data quality will more than pay for itself. If you can help the fraud detection application uh, detect 1% more fraud, if you can help the predictive maintenance application predict with 1% greater accuracy, et cetera, et cetera, it should more than pay for any data quality initiative. Uh, but the key is not only doing it, but making sure that people know that, yeah, data quality did this. All right. Now I got some miscellaneous items to round out my part of the presentation. If you have any questions for me or Stephen or Jesse, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A panel. And we're going to get to them in just about two minutes. I have some things here about when to consider using a data quality tool. And I've had to kind of make up some things. Uh, in terms of numbers of attributes and entities and so on, that sort of thing. But uh, what I'm trying to say here is there's a certain level of data quality, uh, of a certain level of, of, of environment where a tool can really help out. And by the way, those big data collection systems, they don't all get everything uh, exactly once. Sometimes they get it multiple times. You have to look at your particular data store to see how it's doing it. And uh, be careful with that. Data catalogs, I think they are definitely part of the data stack anymore. They serve as the metadata store for all services, including data integration, prep and transformation, data lake, data warehouse, machine learning. We could do a whole presentation on data catalogs and all the wonderful things that you're doing with data catalogs out there. If you haven't started your journey there, uh, your environment's only gonna get more complicated over the next five to 10 years, then less complicated. We're not, we're not to a point where I can even see that they're gonna get less complicated. So now's the time to start putting in some of those pieces around our environment. Streaming data, data quality, wow, yeah. Uh, data's coming in so fast, makes it difficult, extra difficult to assess and maintain data quality. Yet, we still need data quality even in streaming data, maybe not Maybe we're not checking for referential integrity and stuff like that, but we should be continuously monitoring streaming data to identify anomalies, outliers, and deviations from expected patterns. And we should be able to do this without regard for slowing down the stream. So many I have seen are evaluating streaming data just based upon loading the data. And, and I'm guilty of this too. Uh, but not 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 also checking uh, to see what would be the overhead of doing a few data quality checks on that data. And are we still going to stay ahead of the stream? So please do that. Data lineage has become really important, especially with the era of compliance. And this provides you a graphical rep representation, impact analysis of change, root cause analysis. This along this function, which can be found in different kinds of tools. But this function, along with the data catalog, are a couple things that I am recommending be part of your standard stack and uh, be some of those, uh, those bounds that you're putting around your widening data environment. And yes, data quality is getting subsumed into data observability, which gives you not just data quality, but also data freshness, data volume, schema change, data lineage, and FinOps. Data observability is right there as well. And Jessica can tell you more about that from Monte Carlo. So what are my recommendations for you here today? Bottom line, data quality can and should have a value proposition. And it's not gonna happen by, by accident. And every time an application is considered, I want them to come to the data governance team or what have you and get some data quality advice as well. Measure the level of your data quality. Not good enough to say it's good, bad, or something like that, right? It's a business-driven imperative, not an IT one. It's becoming part of data observability. And take care of the people issues associated with data quality, which there are many. Much to say about communication here. Establish the value proposition, proposition for data quality. What is the ROI of adding data quality to each project? And run it as an ongoing process. There you go. 
And now I will turn it back to Shannon to see if we have any questions. William, thank you so much. Lots of great questions coming in. Just to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Um, so diving in here, these came in kind of early. So what are the good choices to measure data quality for data in motion? Uh, what well, there are many tools for doing data quality on static data, but what about data in motion and discover abnormalities in the data, for example, unexplainable variation in volume or unexpected variation in the data values? Okay, um, if that's the question. Um... I'll just, I'll start. Uh, this is kind of what I was touching on when I was talking about streaming data. And uh, this is pre-landing of that data in whatever data store it's going to live out its life in, a uh, data lake or what have you, uh, checking it in, in motion. There are uh, tools available for doing that. A lot of the streaming tools have that ability. We don't all have those abilities, those functions turned on in our stream. I would say there's still a long way to go. But I would say that this whole uh, this whole idea of data quality is making its way over into that world, and you're soon going to see more more possibilities there. And maybe Jesse, uh, maybe you have a, a comment on that with your tool. Yeah, ab absolutely. From the from the Monte Carlo side, um, we've actually just recently. Uh, released our our first kind of entry into helping people do data quality monitoring for streaming data, specifically around Kafka, uh, and this really came from seeing exactly what you what you mentioned there, William. That streaming data is becoming a more kind of integral part of the full data infrastructure. It's helping people move it in motion, maybe just move it in motion between two places at rest, or actually like you know, needing to use that data in motion to power generative AI models or, you know, real-time interactions, things like that. So it's becoming a much bigger part of the data stack and needs to have the same level of data quality checks on it that um that we've kind of known and kind of seen be evolving for the data at rest. So it's very much kind of a, a new space, but needs the same kind of data quality checks as the rest of it. And anything you want to add? Uh, no, I think Jesse's covered that pretty well. So uh, I've got just three minutes here, but uh, I'm going to see if I can get as many questions in as possible. How do you suggest handling the scenario where people say data quality is important, but resources aren't allocated because there are too many business operational items to focus on? <laughs> um, I hope I I hope I did. Uh, you know, not easily, uh, um, but uh, with great communication. Uh, I think that's that's the real basis for <clears throat> breaking through uh, uh, in that scenario, which I've encountered so many times. Um, yeah, this is this is this is a problem. Why you want it? You want to add this many thousands of dollars for for data quality checks and this much time to the project? We don't have that much time. Well, okay, you're going to live with this level of efficacy of a project then, and and I just take it back to okay, our, your data quality score will be a sixty. And your ROI will be uh, this and that. And if we raise it, studies have shown, generally speaking, if we raise it to a certain level, you're going to get better ROI out of the application. As a matter of fact, it'll probably be the difference between what we're going to call success and what we're going to call failure. So which do you want? Uh, and, and, and by the way, a lot of times people say they don't want data quality, but, but then break it down. Break it down. Do you want the data to... To uh to to be let's say do do we want gaps in the data do you want gaps in the data is that going to serve you well no uh do do you want uh, uh uh numerous customers in the database with the same customer ID oh no well that that's data quality so when you break it down you get to a better conversation about it. Stephen or Jesse anything you want to add. Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, seeing is probably also believing sometimes too, right? Like if you involve um, the business early on to put their input and actually have a stake in what does managing data quality look like for them, um, 
it, you know, instead of at, at the very end, uh, having like a data or IT team present, hey, this is what uh, we've done to improve your data quality, but have them say, here's what I need from my data quality um, to actually do my job or meet these goals. Um, it kind of makes them hard to <laughs> escape from the accountability that they're also involved in improving the data quality there. So we've seen that six, um, pretty successful in our use cases. Um, as well as doing, you know, small pilots, right? That takes, you know, just a couple of weeks um, to say, hey, let's uh, see what this looks like, see how well um, this works for us. And does the data quality improvement actually help me at all? Um, and just really allow them to see what the end result is, involve them early. And that typically helps them sort of overcome some of these objections and say, okay, now I understand uh, from the small sample set, this works, um, data quality is actually helpful for what I do. Um, and then go back to your sponsor or stakeholder and say, hey, um, everyone's aligned, right? Um, and, um, and we actually have some use case and uh, success metric. Can we get some more investment and take this to full scale and production or uh, a different um, scenario? So that's typically, I don't know if that's a good answer to your question, Darcy, but um, that's typically what we see. Uh, work. I love it. We're a little bit over time, but Jesse, I want to make sure you have an opportunity to speak if you have something uh, to add there. Oh, no, nothing else to add from you. This, this is great. I love it. Well, you you guys, thank you, Stephen and Jesse, thank you so much for joining us today and your presentations. And William, thank you so much as always. And thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I'm afraid that is all the time we have for the webinar. Just a reminder again, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody so you can get a copy of all of that. Thank you, everybody. And uh, thanks to Monte Carlo and to Samarki for sponsoring today's webinar to help make these webinars happen. Hope you all have a great day. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye.